Hi Founder fans, Jason here, and today's founder is Dr. Joseph Warren. And this is a very special episode because this is the first in a series of interviews I'm doing with not only authors of books, but people throughout the American Revolution industry. Uh, Michael Troy from the AMREV podcast will be here soon. Uh, people who sell different merchandise related to the American Revolution, even at least one interpreter will be coming up in the next few weeks. It's very exciting, especially for me, but should be for you because now we get to have all this extra American Revolution information from people who specialize in certain fields. And today we're starting with Christian Despigna. Now, Christian Despigna wrote this book that's been behind me the whole time, and it is called Founding Martyr. It's about Dr. Joseph Warren, and not only is it great about Joseph Warren's life, but it puts you inside pre-revolutionary Boston like I had never been before. I actually read this book just before I started writing founderoftheday.com, and when I went to my first uh, conference about the American Revolution, I was very nervous. I felt like an outsider as a blogger among all these real authors, and I met Christian, and he was nothing but nice to me and put me at ease and actually made me feel like I, too, could be a part of of the American Revolutionary Community. So I owe him a huge debt of gratitude for that and for being my first guest as an interviewer. Now, it's a little bit long, and this is my first interview, so, you know, I'm not the best yet, but I'm getting better. Uh, and we did it over Zoom, so, uh, you know, the images might not be perfect, but the sound is great, and he is just a wealth of knowledge. So I will stop now. I hope you enjoy. There is a link to this book down below. I cannot recommend this book enough. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for being here. And tell us, when did you discover Joseph Warren? And was there anything in particular that made you attracted to him right off the bat as a subject? Yeah, I mean, it was probably over 20 years ago, I had found a, a book in a secondhand bookstore that had been published, I think, in 1835. And it was called Stories Related to General Warren by a lady of Boston. It turned out that it was uh, Warren's niece who had written it. And you just see so many things he had done, right? He was at Lexington Concord, the Boston Massacre Ration, Suffolk Resolves, involved with the Tea Party, killed at Bunker Hill, Paul Revere on his midnight ride. And it's just amazing that someone who was really involved in so many of these events, and you just don't really hear about him. Like so many books that you'll read on the revolution, like Warren's name is just, you know, a sentence here or something there. And then, um, David Hackett Fisher, Paul Revere's Ride came out and Warren's name is just peppered throughout that entire book. And, and Fisher did a tremendous job at the end with the historiography and he broke it down with what groups these Sons of Liberty were involved with, whether they were Tea Party participants, Sons of Liberty, whatever it was. And it was really Warren's name and Revere's name that were on so many of the lists. And it's just, it really got you thinking like, why have we not heard more about him? And that's really what made me decide to delve into it. Well, it's so funny you bring up Paul Revere because one of my questions actually is uh, the relationship between Paul Revere and Joseph Warren. If you could comment on that, were they acquaintances or close friends or I, I don't know, work you friends, know, counterparts? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that was what I've always been fascinated with that mystique around Paul Revere's ride ever since I was a kid and I grew up in New York City. So it was just something always fascinating to me. And when I found out that Warren was the one who dispatches Revere and Dawes on that ride, it just really just opened up that treasure trove for me. And, you know, Revere is several rungs below Warren on that social ladder. I mean, Revere is a goldsmith, but he really is he becomes really Warren's go-to person. He's sending him on missions. Look, when Warren writes those Suffolk resolves, it's Revere who he dispatches to the first Continental Congress, right? And this is what, nine months before Lexington and Concord. So, you know, and really these men were closer than a lot of people I think would ordinarily assume because first of all, they were both Freemasons. So there's, there's a bond there with the Freemasonry, okay? we know that Revere is reporting British troop movements directly to Warren and a few other of these higher level Sons of Liberty. Plus both men's wives die within a week of each other in April, 1773. Both men have lost children in infancy. So there's definitely a strong bond there. You know, and you really could make the argument that, you know, once Warren dies, there goes his direct conduit to this upper, upper echelon of the Sons of Liberty, right? Because they really do have this extremely close relationship. And, and Paul Revere names one of his sons after Joseph Warren, Joseph Warren Revere. 
So the men, the men were very close. They were involved in espionage activity together. So the relationship was more than just an acquaintance. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to Joseph Warren joining the Patriot cause, was there, there were many reasons for it, obviously, but was there one thing that's, or, that stood out to him or maybe one particular person who swayed his opinion? You know, and this is sort of the um, tug of war because you think really given Warren's background and the fact that he was getting so much financial patronage from these high level uh, loyalists, right? The Royal Governor Thomas Hutchinson. So Warren knows Hutchinson from when he's a kid. He helped settle the probate will of Warren's father when Warren's father dies as when Warren's 14 years old. Warren's appointed as the uh, almshouse physician for the town of Boston, which was an extremely lucrative position. Hutchinson appoints him as the administrator to the Wheelwright Estate. So Warren's receiving all this financial patronage. You look at his medical ledgers from the early 1760s, and you see all these loyalist names, right? The Hallowells, the Olivers, the Hutchinsons, the Fluckers. So when Warren does make this jump into the political foray, he re it really is, and I always say that it really is the equivalent of financial suicide. And so I think there, if I had to point it to one person, and, and this is where I believe that, that there's no doubt that Sam Adams was a political mentor to Warren, but, but to assume that when Warren enters this Whig faction that he's just this empty shell who has no opinion. I mean, that's just a naive approach to it. Warren is definitely heavily entrenched in his radical philosophy, his political ideology. And there were several events when Warren was younger that would have pushed him towards this radical movement. And one of them was, I've talked about this, the land bank. And this was a, this was really a convoluted kind of mess where it was, it had to do with hard money versus paper currency. And Warren's grandfather suffers horribly financially as a result of this because the Royal Administration Parliament strikes this down and the men who were involved in it are really financially ruined. And you know, many authors and scholars point to one of the reasons that Samuel Adams became such a vehement radical was because his father was one of the principal investors and founders of this land bank. And so we didn't really know until this research that Warren's maternal grandfather was also one of the principal investors. And for 20 years, he's writing pleas to the court, being dragged in and out of lawsuits. And this Warren would have seen because Warren's grandfather becomes a mentor to him because Warren's father dies when he's only 14. So this really was one of the lesser known events that really kind of gave Warren a push towards that radical faction. That is fascinating. And you do hear similar things, if not exactly a land bank, but similar banking issues in other states leading up to the revolution. It's very important. And thank you for bringing it up because oftentimes it's completely overlooked. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, uh, Joseph Warren becomes a patriot. Uh, he ends up getting appointed as a major general, but makes the decision instead to go fight on the front lines, for lack of a better term. Um, do you have any insight as to why he would make that decision? Was it that he had no experience as a general or leading men, or is it just a die for my country kind of ideology? You know, I, I, I think, and it gets a little confusing because he's nominated a major general of the provincial army in Massachusetts, right? So as the president of the provincial Congress, he really can't appoint his own commission, but he is nominated to the position on June 14th. So it's not completely official on the 17th. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, Warren was irresponsible for, for leaving his children and fighting. And, and I think the difference has to be made that I think it was a, a foolish move, but only because Warren was so important at this point to the Patriot movement, right? He becomes this on the ground leader and to go into such a dangerous battle, it really does create a vacuum in this leadership. And when you read the letters between Warren and the founding fathers at the Continental Congress, you realize these men are relying on him as their eyes and ears of what is happening and what is transpiring in Boston. So when he goes, it's also a noble thing, right? We talk about the, um, the ability, what does it mean to be 
noble back then or what does it mean to have honor and it's just i think that warren was the type of person who really wasn't consent content to sit behind a desk he was someone who was always on the front lines right that second boston massacre in march of 75 the British soldiers are threatening to assassinate anyone deliver, who delivers it. I mean, Warren volunteers. You know, I always say, why do we call it Paul Revere's Midnight Ride? Because it's actually Warren who rides out to Lexington and Concord on the way, stops in Monotomy and, and, and fights in the roughest part of the battles, almost killed when a musket ball knocks out his hairpin. So this is someone who's demonstrated time and time again that he's going to be a man of action. But yeah, he goes and think about it. I mean, Warren doesn't have a lot of military experience. I mean, hardly any, but we know he's thinking about it as the head of the Committee of Safety, trying to procure arms and ammunitions. And one of the books in his library was titled Diseases Incident to Armies. So we know that he's already thinking about a possible war, possible disease spread. So when he shows up to this Battle of Bunker Hill, June 17, 1775, we also have to realize that we we have the benefit of hindsight. He doesn't. You know, there was no guarantee as he's riding out that there's going to be a pitched battle with over a thousand casualties. So, but if you think about it, Warren knows the terrain better than anybody there, right? So Putnam and Prescott, these are Connecticut guys. You know, Warren grew up in this area. So when he shows up, Israel Putnam, and, and just think about how incredulous it is that these men, we're talking about a really hierarchical society in Boston. And these are men who are like 20 years his elder and who have had fighting experience from the French and Indian Wars. And here comes really this, this 34 year old kid who shows up and they're saying, you take command of the battle. And he refuses both times because both Israel Putnam and Colonel William Prescott offer him full command of the battle. And he declines both times and says, I'm going to fight as a volunteer. Where is the fighting going to be the worst? And that's when they direct him to the redoubt on Breed's Hill. That's absolutely fascinating. I've, just reflecting on what you said, I've always considered that when Washington shows up a month or so later, he was taking over from Artemis Ward. But the way you say it, it's almost like as the eyes and ears of Continental Congress, he was almost taking over for Joseph Warren. And, and that's the point I try to make, Jason, because, you know, and this is not, you know, this is not to, you know, tear down Washington by any means, but we really have to look, and I keep saying this, we need to look at this from a 21st, not a 21st century mindset, an 18th century mindset. And we have to realize that this is Boston, 1775. It's not Yorktown, 1781. So that really, it's sort of this, this takeover. When Washington shows up, it begins this new period, right? I think it was Joe Ellis that wrote that when Washington shows up at Cambridge, thus begins, it, or either maybe Chernow or Ellis, it's like, thus begins his new career. This begins the beginning for Washington. So that's the point. Washington's not Washington at this point. He will become Washington, but when he shows up in Cambridge, it's amazing because the founding fathers are writing to Warren telling him, please welcome Washington, read his charge in front of the troops. They're not writing those letters to Artemis Ward. That's amazing. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, now, I asked you to engage in a little speculation, but I have a question that's a lot of speculation, yeah. uh, if, you, if you will indulge us. Uh, yeah, of course. Should Warren have lived another 15 or so years to see the ratification process of the Constitution? Again, there's no way to know the answer to this, but in your estimation, do you think he would have been more of a Federalist or an Anti-Federalist? Boy, it's hard to say. And so I'm going to dodge that speculative question by, by answering maybe a few of the speculative general questions. And, you know, I always get, do you think Warren could have become president of the United States? Do you think Warren would have surpassed Washington? And, and I think the best way to answer these questions is that these are the great what if questions in history, right? And I always try and go back to these 60 days, right? The period between Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill. So I try to say, well, would there have been an American Revolution if there was no shot heard around the world? If there was no Battle of Bunker Hill, would an Olive Branch petition from the Continental Congress have been more successful to King George III had there not been so many casualties? We don't know. What would have happened had Warren survived Bunker Hill when Washington shows up? I, I, I really find it hard to believe that Warren would have eclipsed Washington, but when you think about it, 
Think about how valuable Warren's insight and input would have been to Washington to have him there. And I, I always mention this famous quote when Washington calls the, the patriots in Massachusetts or the people, the, the dirty, nasty rabble, right? Just imagine how much easier Warren could have made that transition of power, be, you know, this friction between North and South had a man like Warren been there, right? Because Warren's a professional Harvard graduate. He's educated. He's well known to the people of Massachusetts. So what I do say is that there's no doubt that Warren would have been just as important in the post-revolutionary era as he would have been in the pre-revolutionary era. So is that enough dodging and weaving for you? Yeah, that or? is a great dodge. <laughs> well, you can see you think he's at least be important, which uh, to a degree, you know, you have like Sam Adams and John Hancock, who, if I'm, my timeline's right, are at that point in Philadelphia, they would later go on to not be so, on the national stage, be so important. Right. To, right. to Massachusetts, of course, they were, but uh, so you at least hinted that he would have been on the national stage to some I degree. To some <laughs> degree, but I don't think it's even a stretch to say, well, guys like Hancock and Adams become the governors of Massachusetts. Would it be a stretch to say Warren would have become governor of Massachusetts? I don't think so. Would he become president? I don't think so. I don't. I think I think Washington was going to be Washington, and it would have been great had Warren been on the scene to maybe help. Would Warren have followed Washington further south? I don't know. Would he have remained in Massachusetts? More likely, you know, we just don't know. But again, it's these great speculative questions. But again, you know, Warren was important. You know, I hear sometimes from people saying, "Well, the founding fathers really didn't know who Warren was," and it's nonsense because they. They all unanimously adopted his Suffolk resolves at the first Continental Congress. So they all knew who Warren was. I mean, Washington would have known that Warren is killed on the battlefield and that he leaves four orphan children. Like, you know, when, when you have a man of Washington's character, his morality, his bravery, you know, how could he not look at someone like Warren, who just paid the ultimate price on the battlefield and not and not want to emulate those actions or at least admire that or respect it? So, I hear you. Well, let me ask you a question that's not so speculative. It's just your opinion. And yeah. we like to end our interviews like this every time. Are there right. any other founders other than Warren who you think should deserve a little more recognition either on the national stage or in strictly revolutionary circles? You know, and, and again, I'll dodge and give you a general answer, but I, I think what's important is now, you know, especially now we're seeing, you know, for the past like 20 years, we've seen trends in scholarship take a new uh, turn. But, you know, it, it made me wonder throughout all this, when you start reading about like these less marginal characters that really there's there's really just no primary source evidence or letters you start to think you know how many women how many african americans were pivotal during this time because it's just naive to think that women and african americans native americans weren't involved you, you take someone like phyllis wheatley or you take someone like mercy otis warren there's a paper trail there but how many women have been instrumental to the revolutionary movement. How many African Americans Americans played a part? Like we know that at the Battle of Bunking Hill, Warren's fighting side by side with African American soldiers. So it really, you know, that's what makes me think it. It's such a shame when you think that because these people were marginalized at this time and enslaved and really had no rights, couldn't go to school. How many unknown stories are we never going to know about because there is no paper trail or because these stories that were passed down from generation to generation and eventually die out, we will just never know these things. You know, there's always going to be patriots and, and, you know, dead white guys who could always deserve a little more recognition or, you know, have a light shine on them. Were they pivotal in a certain battle? You know, we're always going to have a bias to people we research, right? Like for me, it's Warren and I think he was instrumental in and I try and make that case. But I think there's so many other lesser known people, soldiers on that battlefield who gave their lives or who did something else. And we're just never going to know those stories. Well, that is a great answer. I would not consider that dodging the question at all. <laughs> it's not one specific name. It's, it's the unknown. And that's, I really yeah. appreciate you bringing that up. I appreciate well, it. Christian, thank you so much for joining us. I will speak for everyone watching and say that you are so much fun information, and I can't appreciate it more. Hey, I appreciate you having me on, Jason, and keep up the good work. So I really hope you enjoyed that interview. I had a great time, but I am also being selfish. Buy this book. The link is down below. Again, I can't recommend it enough. 
not just because Christian's the nicest guy in the world, because this is actually one of my top five favorite American Revolution books. So thank you again, and make sure you subscribe, because next Thursday we'll have another interview with Michael Troy of the AmRev podcast.